So, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, uh, how to get your organization using Teams. Uh, I'm Cornel Bonnens. I'm a senior program manager within the Teams engineering group of uh, Microsoft. So for today, I'll be talking uh, about a nice uh, adoption and change management session. So if you were expecting a very technical session, um, you're in the wrong one. Uh, we're, we did a session yesterday about uh, the technical prerequisites and how we can get your organization from a technical perspective to move from Skype for Business to Teams. So today we'll talk about um, the biggest hurdle in every uh, change, which is your end users. Um, before I start, a little bit about myself. So uh, I've been with Microsoft for about eight years. Um, I uh, specialize in our networking and voice um, a portion. I own a portion of uh, the features for the product, uh, specifically around the IT Pro side, such as the Network Planner. Um, I know a bunch of stuff about adoption too, and that's what we'll be talking about. I have some defects as a speaker, which I'm uh, very well aware of. Um, I, I do... Uh, I tend to speak a little bit quick, I tend to walk around a lot, and I am easily distracted. So if you can bear with all of that, then um, we're going to have a fun session today. So for today, um, the four topics. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, making a case for change. We'll talk about our adoption framework, which is something that we've created and you can download so you can um, have a lot of uh, help during this change period and how to get your organization to start uh, deploying and adopting teams. We'll talk a little bit about the technical readiness and the governance features that are uh, within teams because you need to think about that before you do the deploy these. And we have a special guest from one of our valued customers, DSM. And they're going to talk a little bit about um, how they are adopting to change and uh, adopting to teams and the changes they're making for teams. So that's our planning for today. Let's talk about a case for change. So first of all, for those that went to IS presentation, um, summary of this is uh, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at a new way of working. We've got... Um, where we usually, where we used to have a lot of different islands that were communicating with each other, and we had a lot of different methods of communication. Uh, when people join the workforce and when people are um, uh, in, in their home life, when they're using the technology, they they're using existing things like Skype, they're using WhatsApp, they're using all these technologies that give them an easy way to reach people, find people, communicate with other people. Um, we want this in the workplace as well, and we see a growing need for this, um, which is also a transformation that Microsoft went through. So if you look at our products, instead of having all these separate products um, with separate entrances, such as SharePoint, and you would go to Staff Hub, and you would go to Skype for Business, um, we see that we get these, the, a lot of these requests of a single point of entry, whether you're mobile, uh, because we see a lot of people are using Teams on their phones. They want to be able to be in the train. They want to be able to be in the... Well, it's not allowed, but people do it anyway in the car. Um, and they want to be able to uh, communicate with each other and get all the information they need wherever they are. Um, we see that um, people want to do this on a global scale, want to be able to communicate with each other wherever they are in the world. And um, we see a big change of individual work and individual contributors to move into a more teams and uh, collaboration-based um, uh, workforce. So we need to adapt our technology and we need to adopt... Um, uh, and sometimes people have to be a little bit encouraged to, to work in these kinds of ways as well uh, so they can use this technology as well. So... Um, for a successful adoption of Teams, we need this change in behavior. We need a change in the way we look at technology. Um, um, teams, if, if we go out and we tell people, hey, you, you, you were using Skype for Business, you were using SharePoint, um, here's Teams, you, you'll be using that now, they will never use it. Um, I said it yesterday, and I'll, I'll say it again, everybody loves change as long as everything stays the same. Uh, people don't 
like it when someone comes in and tells them, you were using A yesterday, tomorrow you'll be using B, because I want you to. The change to move to Teams is about people, and we want people to want to change to Teams. So uh, the good news is that uh, we will help you with that, and uh, you'll be the ones driving that change. So uh, we have this change curve. And when I say everybody wants, uh, everybody enjoys and everybody wants change, but as long as everything stays the same, it's, it's remarkably true. Um, looking at a, a very uh, summarized version of this change curve, we start off with, with denial. I, I don't want this change. I don't want, I don't need to change. It's not good for me. Um, it, it, you're, you're making me do it. Uh, I don't need it. Right? We don't need to change nothing. It's fine. We go into resistance where people say, um, okay, so if I'm forced to change, um, you can't make me do it. I'll, I'll use my own. I'll use WhatsApp. I'll use something else. Then we go into, oh, it looks like my colleague is, is happy using it. It looks like my colleague, the, he didn't die using Teams. Maybe I can use it too. Um, exploring, saying, hey, it might not be as bad as I thought it would be. And then you go into the commitment uh, uh, portion, where people are happy and they say, oh, we, I don't want to go back. This, is actually, this actually works very well for me. So this, if you're currently trying to deploy Teams and you get resistance in your organization, um, you're not alone. People don't like change. And um, there's this change curve you need to go through. And we'll help you with that. So um, when you start, uh, most of the, 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 the organizations change the same way. This curve applies to everybody. Uh, it's important for you to understand and assess your organization before you start on this change. Your different groups within your organization will have different needs. Uh, your, uh, management level, your management layer will uh, expect some individual attention. There's nothing wrong with that. Spend some time with them. Um, power users would normally love to be advocates for your products. Um, give them some extra attention and they'll help like an oil spill to um, move the product forward. Um, every uh, portion of the company will have different needs, but they all have their own champions. Talk to them, talk to those power users and help them understand the products and help them drive your product, make them be your employees, make them be your advocates. Then um, people will tell you what they don't like. They, they sometimes tell you what they like, but they usually tell you what they don't like. Act on that. Uh, Teams is a very flexible product. Um, we allow a lot of integration with different vendors and, and third-party apps. Maybe you can make a positive change out of that negative feedback. And um, People that, uh, the one thing that, that over all the years in the different companies that I've seen, people that complain the most and are the most um, vocal about everything that's wrong with what you're doing are the people that care most about what you're doing. Don't ignore those people. Talk to them and ask them, okay, I, I understand your feedback of this sucks isn't really great feedback. How can I make your life better? What can we do to make sure that you're happy? They go to the curve. They start off with, no, nothing, because you're stupid. I don't want this. Um, ask them how you can make it better. Have a good sit down, work with them, and they can be your greatest champions. So uh, I don't remember, uh, I don't expect you to remember all of this. Um, this is all in our, this is a part of our adoption toolkit, right? This is how we, we want you to understand this reception to change. Um, if you look at the, uh, at the chart, you can see, uh, you can start making a, um, like pick your organization apart. You can start taking a look at your organization because your organization will have people that are early adopters, that are informal adopters, and people that are people, uh, essentially people that don't want this. Um, target your right audience, know your audience, and um, once you make those groups during the changes, you can focus your attention on them and you can focus the changes you want them to make on the right groups. 
So uh, to help you with all this, to help you with these changes, we've got something that's called the Adoption Framework. And you can see one of the changes in, um, in Microsoft as an organization where we started off uh, a long time ago um, with, hey, here's Exchange, you can email now. And um, hey, here's Skype for Business, you have IM now and, and Voice. We're really moving into adoption is key to your success. So you'll see a lot more effort from us as a company into building things like this, like an adoption framework, which is free to use, free to download. It's available for everybody. Um, I'll show a little bit more about this adoption framework because we'll walk through this, um, but also show you a little bit about the, the competence areas that we expect from our partners, from our, uh, our own champions, and that we know will lead to success. So looking at these stages, there are five stages. We start off with assembling a team, defining a strategy, then assess your readiness, build your plan, and then onboard your employees. So this is really from a change perspective. We don't really start touching technologies until we go into a build plan. So let's start off with assembling your team. Um, what are the skills we need to drive that adoption? Uh, by the way, this is all part of our uh, adoption, skill, uh, adoption skills exam. Uh, it's one of the new competencies that I talked about. Uh, we really expect every one of our partners to have at least one person qualified and certified in this exam to ensure that we, our partners can also drive these changes at customers. So the technical competence, that's usually okay with our partners, right? That's, that's there. We want way more. We want organizational development, business acumen, marketing and communications, portfolio uh, management, and especially leadership capability during that period of change. We want our partners and uh, our, our change teams within the customers to be able to lead this change and to move them into using Teams. So, we're talking about assemble your team. So these are the people we would usually have in, in any of our um, change management teams. So we'll have, it's important to have this business buy-in, which we have from our executive sponsor and a success owner. We have a program manager to drive the entire program. We have some champions to be the voice of success within your organization. We also have an IT specialist. Uh, to, to lead the technical deployment of teams. We have training leads, because uh, whether it's individual or teams-based training, or whether it's uh, remote training, we need people trained. Department leads, so they know what's, what are the changes, and they can be your, your voice again towards the departments, ensuring that they're on board with the changes that you want. We have uh, an HR manager, uh, who's responsible for the happiness of the employees, and we have our community manager. Get teams, get those communities out there, and get feedback from them to ensure that uh, you know what's going on within your organization. So once we have a team, we then go into define a strategy. So um, defining a strategy, and I'll touch on this a little bit more because this is um, this is something that we are most of. Most of, peop most of people with a technical background, let's, let's put it that way, are not very uh, familiar with defining that strategy. Um, because they're usually okay with, and if I just look at myself, uh, I'm okay, so what's my strategy? So if, if Teams is deployed, I'm done, right? Uh, it's, it's easy. So I push the button, upgrade everybody, we're done. Um, it's not the kind of strategy that we're talking about. See, that's, there we go. So... Um, what we want to set it is a strategy for the company to buy into. So success is not everybody has Teams installed. Success is everybody's using Teams and is more efficient, is more, uh, can, can find more people, is enjoying their work more. Um, they can do things today that makes them more effective uh, in their work that they couldn't do yesterday. So... Um, some of the outcome examples here, from an organizational point of view, we can say that, hey, uh, my employee retention is better because now they're getting the products that they wanted. 
It can be a cultural change where we say um, this innovation uh, that we're, we're bringing makes people more happy. Uh, tangible results uh, that are directly measurable, like cost savings by using a single product. We don't have to pay for uh, additional training resources. Cost measurement savior. And there are individual outcomes where we say that uh, uh, a lot of people wanted this tool there. They're happy now. So we have a group of people that are more happy, which is a morale, morale out, outcome. So these are all success uh, outcome examples that can be a success criteria. Um, one of the things we also want is, and this is an example, and, and we provide you with loads of, of examples in our adoption framework, where we say, OK, what's our North Star? Where do we want to work towards when we're working on this adoption framework? Oh, sorry, when we're working on adoption using this framework? So, um, for example, and it, here we see that our employees experience a highly productive environment where technology empowers everyone to achieve more while never getting in their way. Beautiful sentence. So, what does this mean? Um, and these are the, the three measurable results. We want a seamless experience for users. We have delivered on the business agility. And we have a simplified IT security and governance. So this could be one of your North Stars that you want to deliver to your management team, where you say, hey, this is the change we want to bring to your organization. This is why we're using Teams. This is how we measure our success. Um, to get Teams um, in the hearts of people, Let's use that way. We want to have some use cases. So we provide you with a bunch of use cases, but these use cases are also important for you to think about. How do we get people to use the products? How do we get them to embrace this change? So um, uh, if you look at uh, the different groups that we've divided this under, looking at marketing, we can get the marketing uh, department all excited if we tell them, hey, it's way easier for you to collaborate together, to coordinate a campaign. Um, we have some examples, and I'll give you the resources in the end, for example, on success with teams, where we have great examples and scenarios for a marketing team that's using um, Twitter integration and also some of the sentiment integration that we offer so that they can coordinate a marketing campaign through teams and they can see immediate results in teams. They can immediately see if the market is picking up their campaign and if they're responding positively. Great example. So these use cases are really helpful to get those organizations on board with the change. To define the success criteria, um, as I said, we, we have this, um, this notion of oh, when, when was team successful? Okay, everybody's using it, it's successful. Uh, no, you, you need to measure success on more than just uh, how many active users you have. So. These success criteria, we can help you set up. Uh, for example, one of the success criteria could be, um, are, your, are your users happy? What kind of a rating do they give on their knowledge of Teams and of the, on the usage of Teams? Um, perhaps you say, well, we want a 8 out of 10 for knowledge. We want people to self-assess their knowledge. That could be a success criterion. Uh, on uh, aka.ms slash user surveys, we give you a bunch of um, different surveys you can give to your users and you can send out to measure those success criteria to ensure that um, once you've deployed and once you've completed your adoption, that they are happy and that you've met those um, adoption goals that you've set. With that, we go into uh, assess your readiness. So with, while we're, we're assessing the readiness, uh, deploying teams is also a great opportunity to look into things like governance. Um, <clears throat> so when we plan that deployment, we do this uh, with your core technical uh, talent, uh, and we provide all these activities you do with your stakeholders. You will need to do your security reviews, you will need to, do, um, need to think about support readiness, you will need to think about how do we get feedback on the usage of Teams. Um, the beauty of, one of the beauties of Teams is that once you start deploying it, you also get a great opportunity to once and for all spend some time with your current governance, governance models and how you should be um, 
uh, how do we say it? Uh, how you should be uh, maintaining your uh, data and ensuring that your data remains your data. So um, one of the things that we encourage you to think about, and we know that um, if you just start deploying teams, then this is easily forgotten, is uh, things like who do you want to be able to have, uh, uh, who do you want to give the ability to create those teams? Do we just want to give them the ability to create any name they want? Uh, I can assure you, you get very weird namings. Um, does everybody want to be able to, to set up a meeting? Do we want external users to be part of that or not? Do we uh, approve certain apps? If you're a development company, apps like Jira can be extremely helpful. Um, there are also many apps, uh, like in the, in the main communication channel. Do you want a, a, a party app or a chat app like Poly? I can imagine you don't want that. Um, what about data security? Do I want to prevent guest access to high business impact uh, channels? These things need to be thought of upfront before you start deployment. Uh, nothing will kill your deployment uh, as quickly as a data breach or as a uh, or a, a, a governance breach like that. So if you have a, a high impact channel and it turns out that everybody could invite essentially anyone in the world to partake in uh, this year's financial results, you, you probably want to think about that before you start deployment. So um, <clears throat> one of the things we can do, we can completely protect all the content in Teams. We'll help you with that. It's actually fairly easy to set up, um, which, will, which uses Azure information protection and will help you with the, the data loss protection. So some of the things you can do is you can limit um, download or saving capabilities from files in certain groups. This all uses the Azure information protection. Um, you can label files. You can ensure that people don't share it outside of that group. You can track where the file has been. Um, all these kinds of things we give to you, and this is all part of your planning exercise. You assess your readiness to ensure that you think about this before you start deploying teams not once it's too late. Uh, we do have some guidance on naming conventions and Teams conventions. We see a lot of our companies going with the organizational approach, where we have a team for um, management, and we have a team for building A, and for building B, and we have a team for, um, say, the telephony guys. So um, the way we build Teams, we think more of it like on the right side, from a collaborative space, where we say, okay, we have a, a, a sales team for customer A, and we have a sales team for uh, Contoso, for example. And the nice thing is once that's done, and you're completed with a team, we also give you the option to archive a team or just completely delete the team. Because once you're done, archive it, set up a new team for the next project. Really depends on your organization. There's a lot of guidance in that adoption toolkit that will help you with making the right decisions for this. Once again, this is all the stuff you think about before we go deploy. Go deploy. If you do this right, your users will be a lot happier, and they they can they they get teams at that point. Um, so this is all stuff that that you think about to ensure it makes sense to them when they start deployment. Um, how most customers are dealing with governance, because that's one of the questions we get quite a bit. Um, set those naming conventions so, we, so that you're in control of how people are naming their teams and their groups. Um, set an expiration policy. If nobody uses a team for a year, do you really need that team? Set an expiration policy, use the team's life cycle. People get a warning that says, hey, it looks like you haven't really used that team that much. Do you want to keep it or delete it? Um, create those processes during the team creation to ensure multiple owners and allow, any, uh, allow or disallow anyone to the option to create a team. Um, the reason behind this is that if someone leaves the company or someone's on vacation, you want to be able to make changes to the team. You want to have multiple owners or else the, the one person is going to be completely overloaded. Um, and we see a lot of great use out of people that are creating their own teams. Stuff to think about up front. 
Um, we do see a lot of companies that have a set of fixed organizational teams, for example, HR announcements, um, management announcements, uh, a pure management channel, things like that. And we see them mixed with um, like a, a sales department that has a different sales uh, activities as separate teams within there. Mix and match to wherever it applies. Um, we do encourage you to only enable the applications that are relevant for your company and not make it a free-for-all. It will really help you uh, manage all the content and ensure that you know what's going on and, you, and that you're in control. Um, at that point, we go to building a plan. How do we start deploying teams from a more technical perspective? Because we've, we've, done, we've set up a team um, we've defined a strategy, we know what our success criteria are, we've thought about governance and how we want to name the teams and how they should be created. Now it's time to build a plan to ensure we deploy it correctly. So uh, once we start building that plan, we have sort of three phases when deploying teams. We have this initial plan where we make the, 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 the let's say, the, the workbook in which we say, uh, this is when we do what. We have phase two, experimental, where we do the pilots, we get our power users trained, um, our champions, and we've got phase three, where we start to scale out teams. One of the really, really important things, and I've mentioned this a couple of times by now, is to build that sustainable champions community. Uh, we help you with that community, which means that we have special calls that they can join, um, we have um, a lot of uh, help and, and um, presentations and training for those champions, so they can be the advocates of teams within your company. Make sure they're known, so that if someone has a problem with teams, they don't start running off to IT, but they have a champion that helps them and helps the adoption of teams. Um, this champions community really important. Uh, they um, uh, we've uh, at Microsoft we do this internally as well. So we have those teams champions uh, groups as well. And so like once uh, once every few months they go out to dinner, have a nice dinner together. They get different kinds of rewards for being in the champions community. In exchange, they respond to people that have questions about teams. They go sit down with someone who has a problem with teams. Um, it's very easy to set up, and once it's set up, they will do most of the work for you when it comes to adoption. Once that's done, we start. We, we now have our plan, we have our champions, we can start deploying teams, we've got all of that done. We now start onboarding those employees. So, um, the four steps in that, so we start off with creating awareness. Uh, with these campaigns, we have some help that are posters, mailings, videos, things like that to increase the awareness of teams within your organization. Um, and result on the bottom, land the message. Teams is coming, teams will help you be more productive, teams is a good change, you, you really want change. At that point, you move into um, engagement. You start training people, uh, you get the team's champions done. Um, you have team's expert engagements at scale, so people know who to go to when they have a problem with teams, who to go to when they have questions. Um, at that point, that's supporting the change. People feel confident that they can start using teams because they know where to go to. They know where to go when there's a problem, and they know that this is not a IT-focused change, that this is something that will make their life better. From there, we do have to measure. We want to know the sentiment. How are people enjoying the change? Do they want things differently? Do they have some negative or positive feedback? Uh, you analyze and adjust. If everybody says, um, I really miss this specific app, add the app. In the end, you end up with management. Um, see if there are quality issues, see if there are things that should be changed, things that should be better, um, improve the product for employee feedback, maybe they want custom bots, custom apps, uh, see how you can improve upon that, and improve the experience for the end users. 
at that point, there's also a fantastic time to start um, moving away from Skype for Business. So, <clears throat> what's actually working? What's the feedback we're getting? So, um, five points I've written down for you. So, mapping team's deployment to a company strategy seems to be really uh, resonating with the internal employees. Um, if you, as I stated in the beginning, if you go out and tell them, hey, IT has a new tool for you, uh, that, that's not going to land very well. Um, don't make this an IT toy. Make this something that supports the direction your company wants to go into. Uh, training videos, if you've got to make uh, 30 to 60 minute training videos, ain't nobody got time for that. So uh, nobody will watch those. One minute, more than enough, you can convey a lot of information in one minute. Live training. Uh, people are, um, just think of yourself, if you are ever required to follow a company training, which, so we, we get them a couple of times a month. Um, my main exercise during any company training is to do my email. Um, if it's a live training, uh, I, I always feel very guilty to do that, so I pay a lot of attention. Uh, use that. Get people to attend to a 15, 30 minute class, teach them about teams, make them more effective, and people will pay attention. Uh, phased approach. Uh, we talked a little bit about that from a technical perspective yesterday. Um, start with, uh, you can do Teams and Skype for Business next to each other. Give them the tools, give them some of the uh, handles to start working with that. Give them the tools when they're ready for it. So you can start with collaboration, add voice, add meetings, um, once, you're, once they're trained and they know how to use it. Um, the champions community, and I keep coming back to that, is super important for a good uh, adoption. When people know who to go to, when people have um, a voice of a product within a company, they're way more likely to use it. With that, that's enough about me. We have uh, Michiel Zandberger from DSM. He's going to talk a little bit about how they did their, uh, or they're doing their adoption using Teams. So here's Michiel. Thank you. It's really interesting to see how uh, much attention there is if Microsoft is pushing a product and uh, killing something else. Um, my name is Michiel Zandberg and I work for DSM already all my life, I would say, almost 20, 28 years. And I am currently the uh, enterprise technology architect. Um, maybe a little bit about DSM. Um, because DSM is a global company, uh, active uh, in 80 countries, 200 sites. Uh, but you might actually not know our products, although uh, you will consume it or use it every day. Um, you probably had a beer last night or maybe bread this morning. Uh, you use a smartphone. And we are active in all those in, in products or in components that are used in all those uh, materials. Um, and especially in nutrition, in health, and what we call uh, sustainable living. So we create uh, materials, we create products, uh, food ingredients, which make people happier, uh, which make their life more, uh, let's say, sustainable. So uh, the slogan of DSM is to really make sure we create brighter lives for all. And uh, DSM is a company that was founded in 1902. It originally stands for uh, Dutch State Mines, but by now, we say it actually is really something different. It's doing something meaningful. Yeah, creating brighter lives for all is something meaningful. And what we try to do with our company is to make sure that we do that every day. Um, and there's a, it's a real uh, spirit within the company to do things smarter and to do it differently. Um, so also in the way we looked at collaboration and adoption, we have the uh, plan to do it differently. Uh, Cornel talked about it as well. Um, and you'll probably know such a picture about change management. Huh? It's like we all embrace continuous learning, <clears throat> but most of those learning sessions are not very effective. 
And that means that, uh, yeah, we try to do this with every uh, change. We try to make the change small. We do a lot of communication around it. But in the end, if you look at the real effectiveness of that, what we try to achieve is very, let's say, experienced uh, users or uh, very, very, let's say, proper usage of the tools. It doesn't work like that. Um, so we tried now to come with a different approach. So for this year, especially this year, we said, okay, let's not make the, small, the changes small, but let's make them very big. So we have the, uh, uh, the intention to focus on making our people more digital savvy. Uh, by, by making them all part of a digital workforce. And we want to use that by stimulating uh, digital workplaces. So uh, the workplace should be compelling. And the workplace should really be fun. Allow you to work together. Uh, perform, uh, but especially connect people. So we all feel that we use the same tools, we find it recognizable, and it's very nice to use, and it will always be there on every device. And, of course, you can recognize it on many of these, of these things. Teams will support us. So that's what we are trying to do. So in our move from Skype for Business to Teams, we've done a few things already. So we have done, uh, uh, we are in island mode, we have done early adopters, we have done the technical tests. Uh, and we want to make sure now that we start promoting teams. Not because it has to happen, but because it's really fun. Uh, next step is also that we will then promote it in groups of people. So people that work together in the same site, or on the same technology, or on the same product, make them move. Uh, and if we do that smart, they will be happy. So we want to make sure we measure that, not only from a technical perspective, how Teams behaves compared to Skype, but especially if people are happy. What is their user experience? And once that is really good, then we will move to Teams only. But Teams only, again, was not the goal. The goal was that really, let's say, uh, adoption of our workforce. So that's the big, the big hairy goal. And, and it, but for that, we want to avoid to, that, to do that continuous change management approach. Those small learnings with classroom sessions, etc., etc. So, along the way of, let's say, preparing for teams only, we do something else as well. We have, uh, let's say, defined or selected two large units within DSM, where we will do interviews with 400 different people, people from the business, and out of those 400, we will learn we will learn what we need to do to make this collaboration work for us. We will also then adopt and adjust our plans and only then move to that real, let's say, big hairy goal to make our uh, employees, uh, let's say, part of a digital workflow. And if we do that correct, yeah, then we, let's say, uh, reach the states of global virtual collaboration. And Teams is just your neighbor. Thank you. So, thank you, Michiel. Thank you. Um, if, if you look at the, the presentation that Michiel gave, um, it's, it's interesting to see how, we, how they looked at, at KPIs, right? So they looked at, they didn't look at uh, what's, what's success. Is success a technical deployment of Teams? Or is success a, um, a deployment of making their employees more effective to go into this global virtual collaboration? So um, thank you for that. Thank and thank you, you for showing us uh, how DSM is doing this. Um, with, with about 20 minutes left, I'm going to go into the, all the resources and all the stuff where you can find this. Um, I, I, there was one thing that I noticed today and that I do want to talk a little bit of, uh, to you guys about. Uh, so, about six years ago, five, five, six years ago, there was a, um, we started doing adoption sessions in, uh, I know this started, for example, in uh, Teged, Barcelona. And when we were doing these, these adoption sessions, we had about uh, five people in the room. That was the amount of people that were there. Um, and when we were doing these sessions, uh, 
essentially the five people left after about 10 minutes because then they figured out this wasn't about how to deploy a product, this was about how to get people to use it. And the sentiment at that point was from, from the entire audience and I think from the entire uh, IT community at that point was, well, to, to get people to use the product, you have to turn it on, right? That, that's how they use it. And there's not that much choice because, well, <laughs> we decide. Um, and it's very interesting to see how we've moved away from that and how we're defining KPIs uh, based on customer happiness and, and uh, end user happiness. Um, um, if an end user is more effective instead of, oh, did I turn it on or not? So it's, it's great to see this progress. It's a bit of a tangent, I know. Um, anyway, some of the adoption resources we have for you guys. So, Let's start off with the Teams Adoption Hub. If you go to aka.ms slash Teams Adoption, you will find um, all the resources I talked to you about. Um, it's the main hub where you can go if you want to learn more about adoption, learn more about the resources, download the adoption toolkit, all those kinds of things, and to get really started with adopting teams in your organization. Uh, from there, you also find all the downloadable resources, such as the Customer Success Kit for uh, Microsoft Teams. So the Customer Success Kit contains a lot of things like um, posters, um, email templates, videos. Uh, they give you all the help you need to really advocate the use of Teams within your organization. And you can start building your plan on top of that. We have a bunch of online training. So we have Coffee in the Cloud, which is something where we have the different product owners and um, technical resources, but also um, adoption resources, where they talk about different subjects in Teams. They're focused on both end users as well as IT pros, and they will help you get a, um, get a good start on uh, deploying Teams, adopting Teams. There's also uh, aka.ms slash success with teams where we have a lot of practical guidance. So we get a lot of feedback from our customers like DSM. We take that feedback and we ensure that our documentation and our guidance is on par with what our customers are experiencing. So that's all on success with teams. Then we have the teams resource cheat sheet for you. So the four sites that I mentioned, if you want public feature delivery dates or uh, future things or things we've already delivered on, if you want to know about features, go to the roadmap on aka.ms slash O365 roadmap. If you need the technical community, they're on aka.ms slash teams community. If you need practical guidance, if you need the success with teams site, go to aka.ms slash success with teams. And the coffee in the cloud uh, vlog, let's just call it, is on aka.ms slash coffee in the cloud. We do have a uh, Office 365 Champions uh, program. Uh, we talked a little bit about that already. There are uh, monthly calls with the Microsoft experts. We have guest speakers there. Uh, you can join that. Um, they're, they're mostly focused on the champions within your organization. Um, not necessarily IT pro focused, more focused on uh, adoption of the product. Um, and we'll give you early access to adoption uh, resources and tools from there. We uh, also have Microsoft Fast Track. So, uh, a common misconception is that Fast Track is only there for larger customers. No, everybody that has a contract at Microsoft, so buys anything from Microsoft, uh, Microsoft 365, for example, um, can get help from Fast Track, whether it's um, an onboarding call, whether it's uh, the resources that are there, like training videos. Uh, uh, programmatic approaches, anything, um, you can find it from Fast Track. And then, depending on the size and, and the amount of things you need done, uh, we can go as far as on, uh, on site resources to help you guys out. So, it's definitely worth to take a look at Fast Track and just take a look at what they can do for, that, for you. So, and with that, um, I want to open it up to questions. Uh, a big thank you for being here, for enduring with me all this time. Um, 
and thank you for, for your interest in adopting Teams. So please complete your evals, and if you have any questions, we don't have mics, come up to the podium and be happy to help you. Yeah.